Hello and welcome everybody from all around the world, our, our people here. Uh, today we have the session two of our series of four webinars called One Health Approach for Global Health Water, uh, USA and Latin America Perspectives. This webinar is sponsored by Bowder Water for Food Institute and Federal University of Paraná, Brazil. And at the first session, we had experts talking about One Health Network in Latin America, Brazil, and they brought such a challenging topic as the water contamination by the animal and human waste. But in this webinar today, we have to listen about water and diseases. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator of the night, Luciana. Luciana Pierce is a veterinarian, member of the Nebraska One Health Group, and a doctorate student in One Health at the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. Luciana, the microphone is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paulo. And good afternoon, good evening, as I say, boa tarde, and uh, buenas tardes. I know that there are people from India, so I don't know how to say, but welcome <laughs> for everybody that everywhere. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome and to introduce our panelists for this webinar. First, I will introduce Dr. Elizabeth Van Bormer, that we call by Liz. And so Liz is an assistant professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Science and the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. She also coordinates the Nebraska One Health Program. She works with interdisciplinary teams and local stakeholders to study the effects of environmental change, including change in rainfall and water availability on animal, human, and ecosystem health. In the US, she investigates how land use and precipitation change impact parasite loading and runoff from coastal watersheds to the ocean. In Tanzania, she studies the transmission of zoonotic disease from wildlife to people at sites with high levels of human-wildlife interaction. She also investigates human and livestock health in pastoralist communities in a water-scarce region in Tanzania and works with local primary schools to understand human-animal environmental health connection through art, and story, storytelling. After the PhD in epidemiology at the University of California, Davis, she lived and worked on One Health Project in Tanzania. She earned her veterinary medicine degree and a bachelor's degree in zoology from Michigan State University. And now presenting Dr. Karen Shapiro. She holds a bachelor's science degree in wildlife conservation and holds a veterinary medicine degree from both from University of California Davis, a master's degree in epidemiology and a PhD in comparative pathology from UC Davis and is a postdoctoral fellow in waterborne zoonosis. Dr. Shapiro is an associate professor at the University of California Davis and an adjunct professor on Ontario Veterinary College at Canada. She is a scientific advisor for international efforts focused on environmental contamination with toxoplasma, including in France, New Zealand, and in the US. She developed the public K-12 curriculum for coastal health and marine biology and she developed interactive games and educational materials that have reached more than 4,000 children to date. Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Van Bormer are founders of the International Network for Environmental Toxoplasma Studies, a virtual platform to facilitate communication and partnerships among researchers. So first we will hear from Liz. Welcome Liz. Well, thank you, Luciana, for the introductions and thank you for the invitation to join the seminar series. It's really exciting to see people from so many diverse locations and institutions gather to talk about One Health. 
And so we're excited to share our experience with you today. Um, Karen and I are gonna do a joint seminar. We've known each other for a long time. So uh, we'll be handing things off in the middle. Um, so please feel free to uh, ask us questions or save them for the question and answer session. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna try to share my um, PowerPoint slides. I feel like this is always the most challenging part of all presentations. So maybe can anybody give me a thumbs up or a smile? Fantastic, okay, initial success, here we go. So we're really excited to um, be presenting today on the theme of water and diseases. It's a really broad topic area and incredibly relevant to all of our lives. And so we're going to dive into a story, um, our personal One Health experience with a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii um, that Karen and I had the privilege to study as part of a big One Health team starting in graduate school together at University of California, Davis. We've both taken meandering One Health pathways through various jobs and training opportunities. Um, I'm now at University of Nebraska-Lincoln and she's now at UC Davis, but we're still excited to be working together on toxoplasma, which is a field that offers a lot of new questions and exciting One Health approaches, we think. So we're gonna dive into that story later, but we wanna start a little bit more broadly. So water impacts all of our lives in such um, such strong ways. And we might gravitate toward the image of what we're drinking and what's in our drinking water, whether that's from a pond or a tap or a well. And what's inside? Is it a toxin? Is it a chemical? Is it a parasite or bacteria or virus? So a lot of times we focus on drinking water quality when we think about water and disease. But we wanted to step back and also think about interactions with water quantity and what's going on in the landscape. So this is a picture of a river system in Tanzania where I had the privilege to work earlier. And this water, this river used to flow year round but now dries seasonally. And you can see those remaining pools of water. They serve as points of connection for people and livestock and wildlife to all get the water that they need. And while they're sharing a natural resource, those groups can also share various diseases. So water scarcity can drive some of those connections. On the flip side, this is an image from floods, recent floods in Nebraska in 2019 that were associated with pathogens as well. We saw E. coli in some of these flood waters. And so too much water can also really influence water and diseases. And it might be the connection of drinking water, but it could also be you know, contacting water through recreation or movement through a system. We also know that water plays a critical role in shaping where we can grow food and what we can grow. And in turn, those agricultural systems influence the health of the plants we grow, of course, but also serve as connection points between people and livestock and other domestic animals and wildlife too. So there are a lot of ways that water brings us together. Some of that might be in our own backyard. So when we're thinking about water storage, whether it's for people or animals or to provide water for our gardens and growing food, those water containers, we might think about contaminants that can get in, but we can also think about what can come out. So often if we have standing water, it can serve as a breeding area for mosquitoes or other vectors and they can spread diseases to people and animals. So we might be shaping our very local water and disease environment. And this is one that, that struck me later on as I had been thinking about water connections, but this is a livestock dip in East Africa. And what you're seeing is a building and inside that building, there's a pool of water that carries medicine that helps prevent livestock tick-borne disease. So the cattle and sheep and goats go through the pool of water. So this is a situation where you need the quantity of water in order to be able to prevent a certain type of disease. So whatever we're thinking about water and disease, it's a complex connection and it really cuts across people, animals, and our shared environments. So it ties in nicely to the idea of using a more holistic approach to think about these really big challenging questions. And One Health offers us a way to do that, to bring together people from diverse backgrounds and skills and perspectives, to think about creative solutions that can help improve and protect the health of these populations. And when we think about human, animal, and plant health, those are all nested within the ecosystems that we share. And so if we divide those out, we don't have the same potential to think about synergies among them and ways that we might be more creative in addressing the health of the people and, and plants and animals that are sharing a system. 
So, you know, when we think about disease and water, we might just immediately gravitate toward the idea of health professions or life sciences, right? Those are critical fields that are involved in here, whether it's doctors or veterinarians or nurses or environmental scientists or ecologists. But we also really benefit from extending the One Health, you know, umbrella and family and approach to bringing in social scientists, bringing in perspectives from other fields, engineers, economists, lawyers, and thinking about how we can even expand to bring in arts and humanities. So when we're ever thinking about, whenever we're thinking about these complex challenges, we usually need a way to adequately communicate them. And so we can think about the roles of artists and writers in exploring some of these water and disease questions and helping us communicate what we understand about them. So a One Health approach gives us the chance to understand these really complex water and disease connections in new ways. And now we're gonna, we're gonna dive back into the story of Toxoplasma, um, the fascinating world of this parasite. And we're gonna talk about movement of Toxoplasma from land to sea and tell you our experience as a One Health story and approach to understanding waterborne disease from the perspective of this parasite. And so even if we're just focusing on this one pathogen as an example, it takes a big One Health team to understand the diverse points of connection. So we have people on that team listed here, as well as many more on our acknowledgement slide. We just wanna highlight that these people come from all kinds of different perspectives and backgrounds and training and views. And that really enriches our ability to understand the parasite in the system as a whole and to think about ways to protect health. So for those of you who are not familiar with Toxoplasma, it's arguably one of the most successful parasites on the planet. It is a tough and tiny single celled organism that can be found almost everywhere in hosts throughout the world, except in some of the harshest environments. And so when we think about Toxoplasma, a lot of times people think about it as a terrestrial pathogen. Historically, we saw it in people and animals in the terrestrial landscape but we know that it's emerging in new hosts and environments, including in marine systems. So there is definitely an aquatic connection, both with freshwater and with ocean systems, which makes it pretty fascinating. And we know that toxoplasma can have impacts on people, domestic animals, and wildlife. It really cuts across all those spheres of health. Most people and animals, if you're healthy, if you have a strong, you know, a, a well-functioning immune system, Usually people and animals don't have any clinical signs or they have mild illness, maybe flu-like symptoms, but you can see really severe toxoplasmosis and death in certain groups. For example, pregnant women who are exposed during their pregnancy to the parasite can sometimes pass it to the developing fetus with really severe consequences, including fetal defects and abortions, as well as evidence of retinal disease and other problems, even in kids that are born appearing normally healthy. We also know that immunosuppressed people can have really severe um, and sometimes even fatal toxoplasmosis. So um, AIDS patients, as well as people on really strong chemotherapy drugs or um, other drug treatments. If you have immunosuppression, the parasite can cause greater problems. But we're learning that sometimes that's, it goes beyond that for people as well. So sometimes certain strains of toxoplasma and certain types of exposure can affect even healthy people. So there's certainly a public health connection. For domestic animal health, we see that same concern about mothers passing the organism to their babies. So it's a really big concern of um, abortion in goats and sheep. And so domestic animal production industries take this into account as a parasite when they're managing production and where they're thinking about healthy herds. We also know that toxoplasma can be a challenge for wildlife, both from health of individual animals, as well as conservation of populations. And we've seen consequences of toxoplasma in populations of lemurs, in populations of marine mammals. And here too, a lot of times you'll find toxoplasma in healthy animals, not causing problems. But we know in cases of immunosuppression, when, for example, foxes get immunosuppressive viruses like canine distemper, they can get severe um, disease as well. So this idea of having an immunosuppressed system or congenital transmission from the mother to the baby, that can cause risk across some of these groups. And then some of them have severe consequences in sensitive wildlife populations. So where does toxoplasma come from, right? Why is it so widely distributed? 
Well, it has an incredibly broad host range, but the only animals that we know that can shed toxoplasma are domestic cats, like our pet cats and unknown cats or feral cats, as well as diverse wild felids. So in the US, we usually think of these as mountain lions, bobcats, maybe lynx. In areas of South America, you can have much greater felid diversity. So the number of animals shedding toxoplasma in a place really depends on the types of felids living there and how many different species are present. And toxoplasma moves through people and animals in different ways. So you can be exposed, whether you're a person or an animal, the toxoplasma by eating raw or undercooked meat from infected host. So this could be a mountain lion eating a deer or a cat, a domestic cat eating an infected rodent. But it could also be a person who's eating undercooked meat that has the parasite in the muscle. There's also environmental transmission. So we talked about domestic cats and I should go back and say, that cats, when they are shedding toxoplasma, they shed this little circular stage, the oocyst into the environment. This is an extremely hardy environmental stage that can persist under the right conditions for over a year in soil and fresh water and even salt water. And so we can see widespread accumulation of these oocysts. So if you encounter an oocyst, whether you encounter it in contaminated water or if it's in contaminated soil or maybe on food like berries or in a shellfish, which is serving as sort of a transport host of the parasite, you can become infected and animals can become infected in this route too. And we talked a little bit about um, congenital transmission where the parasite can cross from an infected mom to a baby. And that is an area of concern too. But the more we learn about toxoplasma, it certainly is a foodborne parasite of concern. But we know that this environmental route that incorporates waterborne transmission and waterborne outbreaks is a really critical route to understand. The OSS plays a key role across the globe in not only exposing people through waterborne outbreaks, but also exposing animals through um, grazing. So rodents and birds and herbivores like deer that are out grazing in the environment can pick up this parasite as well and pass it on to predators or scavengers and continue the parasite cycle. So this happens all over the world in different ways. And today we're gonna explore what the cycle looks like in California in coastal watersheds that connect the terrestrial landscape and the Pacific Ocean. So I mentioned that historically toxoplasma is thought of a, as a terrestrial or land-based parasite, but our story with California really starts in the ocean. You might mention these, you might, sorry, you might notice or um, be familiar with these um, cultural icons of California, the Southern sea otter. So a lot of people see these pictures and respond with this cuddly sensation of, you know, these cute furry mammals. And certainly they draw in a lot of interest, both from the tourist and science side. But because they live so close to the coast, they serve as amazing sentinels of what's running off the terrestrial environment, whether it's a chemical contaminant or whether it's a biological pollutant like a pathogen. So these sea otters were almost hunted to the point of extinction in the um, late 1800s and early 1900s because people really valued their thick fur coats and wanted to use them for materials like hats. And so after treaties were coming into place to protect them, their populations started to rebound, but they never grew at the expected rate. And when people started studying them more closely, they realized even recently that infectious disease was playing a big role in sea otter mortality. And of those infectious diseases, one of the key ones was Toxoplasma gondii, as well as some related parasites. So it really raised this question of what is this, you know, historically terrestrial pathogen doing in sea otters? What's causing it to end up in these hosts? And we care about this not only from the sense of pathogen pollution, um, we care of it from the point of, you know, conservation of the sea otters, but also because sea otters play a really critical role in coastal ecosystems. So by preying on sea urchins, these spiky purple things at the bottom, they help protect coastal kelp forests, which serve as a biodiversity hotspot in the near shore marine environment. And you're gonna hear more about the exciting role of kelp and toxoplasma later on from Karen. But lots of different species like fish and birds and other marine mammals use these kelp forests. So sea otters are telling us about their health, but they're also telling us about the health of the coastal system, including people who are sharing that. And that becomes really important in the case of zoonotic parasites like toxoplasma. 
So this is our you know, simplified depiction of what's going on in coastal watersheds that drain into the Pacific Ocean. And just so we're all viewing this from the same perspective, we like to think of watersheds as all the landscape that's draining to a point. So you might think of it as the stream or the river that's draining to the ocean. So we have our domestic and wild felids living there, and we, they're shedding toxoplasma oasis into the environment. When an, a cat is infected, they can shed up to hundreds of millions or even billions of these oocysts for a short period after infection. And because these oocysts are so incredibly durable, they can persist in the environment and accumulate. They can be taken up by prey species and go back to felids through that chain or to other predators and scavengers. They can be picked up by livestock that can then connect to people. But we know critically here from the case of water and disease, they can be carried in freshwater runoff into freshwater streams that flow into the ocean. So they can reach freshwater and marine systems. And there we'll talk about later how they might enter the food web and how they could feed back to people from that system as well. And so we wanted to understand, you know, there are a lot of players in this transmission cycle. We wanted to understand it from a One Health perspective. And so this is the area I'm going to be talking about today and that Karen will continue on. It's the watersheds that drain into the Sea Otter Range. So Sea Otters only live along the central coastal portion of California. So we were really focusing on the terrestrial side, or I was focusing on the terrestrial side that flows into the ocean here. So if we break it down, we can think about the parasite loading, the cats that are putting the parasites into the landscape, and then what happens after they're already on the landscape? How do they make it to the ocean? What influences that? And people are really interesting here. I left that person in the diagram because certainly people can become infected by toxoplasma and other zoonotic pathogens. But as people, we also play a tremendous role in shaping all of our environments. And that can change the dynamics between wildlife and domestic animals, the ways we interact, and it can change the way that we share pathogens and how they move in our environments as well. So I think that when we think about One Health, we can think of us as recipients, right, of certain health conditions, but we're also active players in changing transmission. And that might seem like a long journey. It might seem like a stretch to think about toxa moving from mountains uphill all the way down into the ocean. But sometimes that journey is a lot shorter than we think. So this is a picture I took when, during my field work days, and this is a pile of poop. We're gonna talk about poop a lot, so we can all embrace it from here. And these are sea otters right in, the, right in the nearby marine system. So sometimes it might be a long journey, but sometimes it's a much closer connection with our terrestrial landscapes influencing water and disease. So California is a really desirable location and across the world, people love living by the coast, right? You have beautiful ocean views, you have resources for shipping. There are a lot of reasons that shape that and humans have heavily modified the coastal California landscape. So, you know, in places where there were thick traditional forests or grasslands or woodlands, we now have urban environments and agricultural systems. And of course, with us, we've brought our domestic animals like domestic cats, like our livestock that are then interacting with the wildlife species that were already there, whether that's terrestrial wildlife like wild felids and other species or marine wildlife like sea otters. And so today we're gonna to think about those connections and humans shaping the system and toxoplasma oocysts flowing from cat poop, the source into the sea and what happens along the way. So we can think about this from the idea of, can we trace this, right? Can we trace the system and understand what's influenced by people and our domestic pets and what's influenced by wildlife in the system as well? So we did this through a very diverse array of studies and I wanna highlight the partners involved and the approaches involved because there were a lot of people engaged. So we use traditional animal field studies, might be familiar to a lot of the veterinarians where we could sample cats. And we were asking how do domestic cats and wild felids impact oasis load in the environment? And we had partners certainly from the university here, but also the state agency for fish and wildlife, the state department of transportation that helped us find samples from animals that were hit by cars local regional animal shelters and community members who helped us understand the distribution of these hosts in the environment. And sometimes we don't know, right? Sometimes we need community and local guidance to really understand the system. I would argue probably every time we need community and local guidance. 
But we were able to use community input, we were able to use ecological camera methods with remote trapping to get a sense of who's there and who's influencing toxoplasma loading and spread. So we're gonna start on the animal side. I promise we'll get to water, we'll get to people um, and expansive questions about One Health. But at first we were trying to understand what domestic cats are there besides our pet cats. And we realized through these trapping studies with cameras that domestic cats are using a really wide array of landscapes. They're not just confined to our backyards or our agricultural systems, they're out exploring other environments. And so this becomes really critical with toxoplasma at places where we have domestic and wild felids interacting. And we started by saying, can we get samples from these animals and working with partners, we could. And from collecting poop from them and blood, we can understand their infection as well as when they're shedding oocysts and who's shedding more than other species. So we can start to make that link between the source of the oocysts, the felids and the sea otters where we know it's a problem for health. And so through those field studies, we realized that there are different levels of shedding. We saw higher shedding in animals that eat wild prey items, especially bobcats that eat lots of little wild prey items. And domestic cats by, fed by people that are eating cat food or human scraps had much lower levels of oocysts shedding. And so we can already see that there's a difference in domestic and wild hosts that goes in correspondence with people. But you know, what's happening with the oocysts shedding prevalence or the proportion of animals we see shedding doesn't tell us the whole story. We really need to understand how many animals are there out there, right? What are the populations like to get an understanding of impact of it? Is this a domestic animal source? Is this a wildlife source? And so when we looked at the numbers of cats associated with human development and wild felids associated with more undeveloped lands along the coast, we think that there are a lot of domestic cats, these white boxes, contributing to the oocyst load in the environment. So that gives us a clue that people are playing a role, right, through our domestic cats and our associated landscape development in this question of sea otter health and in human exposure. So then we can ask questions not only about the um, what's going on with the infection and shedding of oocysts, we can start making deeper linkages. We can say, do all of the domestic cats and wild felids in the system shed the specific types of toxo we see in sea otters? Can we make a linkage on the genetic level? So now in addition to our animal health field studies, we brought in molecular tools and geneticists to build our One Health team to be able to ask these kinds of questions. And so to do this, we have to dive a little bit into toxoplasma genetic types or genotypes as they're also called. And we're not gonna cover the whole diversity of toxoplasma which varies broadly all over the globe and is really rich in South America. We're gonna just talk about in California. So historically, people when they studied toxoplasma and looked at humans and domestic animals like sheep and goats and cats, they saw three main types of toxoplasma which were creatively named types one, two, and three. But when we look in wildlife, we see more variety. We see these atypical types of toxoplasma. And the majority of sea otters that we've sampled that have um, had toxoplasma infection, and we've got, been able to get the parasite out to culture it, the majority of those have had a type called type X. And so we be it begs the question, where does that type come from, right? It's another tool in our One Health toolbox to think about linkages between domestic animals and wildlife on land and the sea otters in the ocean. And so to do this, we took samples working with all those partners I mentioned of tissues from mountain lions and bobcats and domestic cats, the cats in our system. And when they're infected with taxoplasma, it stays long-term in your tissues. So if the parasite cysts are there, these big balls of little dots right here, you can take out the parasite DNA through molecular methods and through sequencing and other practices, you can say, is this type two? Is this type one? Is it type X? Is it something else? So we can dive deeper into that mystery of land to sea parasite connections. And when we do that, we found that both wild felids, so mountain lions and bobcats and domestic cats are infected with type X. So that's the dominant type in the sea otters. So it's, it's helpful in some ways because we know all the cats could potentially be shedding it, but it doesn't narrow it down to one group, right? It doesn't tell us exactly like where is the source of this parasite? Where are the high areas of loading? 
And we know that both domestic felids and wild felids can cross across developed and undeveloped landscapes, right? They could be more in one system, but you could find domestic cats in wildlands and you could find mountain lions and bobcats coming into agricultural areas, for example. So we wanted to understand what does this mean for toxoplasma in the landscape and for sea otter exposure? And so when we look at it, not only do we see that there all, there's type X infection in these domestic hosts and wild hosts, we also see that it's more common in wild felids, right? It's more commonly seen in areas that are dominated by mountain lions and bobcats. So if we look at, this is Monterey Bay. It's a portion of the coast that we sampled where there are lots of sea otters, the big sea otter tourism industry, and there are areas of uh, undeveloped forests. There are areas of more developed cities and agricultural lands. So it gives us a good comparison site. And when we look at what types of toxoplasma are present here, we see two kinds of cycles. So in the wild lands where we have wild felids like mountain lions and bobcats living, we see lots of type X, that type that's really common in sea otters. When we look at the more developed areas like cities and agricultural areas that are dominated by domestic cats, we see lots of type two, which can infect sea otters, but is less common in them. And we know through other studies that type X is actually more virulent or problematic for the sea otters. So it tells us that there are different cycles of transmission and they're influenced by people, right? Because the more wild areas have the type X and the more domesticated or developed areas have type two. But these cycles can overlap and the hosts can connect, they can share food resources. And in areas where we have lots of fragmentation of agricultural systems and wild lands, we also see these little blue dots emerging here. So the purple are the type X's, the orange are the type twos, and these blue dots are the something else's, the new types that we're seeing pop up. And so my point of sharing this map, which is a little bit cluttered, is to say that the way that we shape our landscape, right, the role of people in determining where we put our agricultural systems and how they interact with wild landscapes may have a strong influence on even the type of parasite that's there as well as its ability to flow off the landscape into the ocean. So that part, we, we've come to the conclusion from those early One Health studies that um, linking animals and agricultural environments and um, wild environments and human use, we've come to the conclusion that both domestic and wild felids play an important role in putting oasis in the landscape. And now we have to transport those to the ocean, right? How many of them make it there? So now we brought spatial modeling tools and hydrologists onto our One Health team. As a veterinarian and a veterinary student, I never thought I would be working on hydrologic models or talking about people about sediment flow and water flow. And so it's, um, it's a really exciting time to be able to learn from different disciplines about ways to think about these complex problems. So we were actually able to take what we knew from the field studies and link that with literature what we know about the distribution of developed and undeveloped lands and where people live through census data and estimate how many oasis are distributed in these coastal watersheds. And then using the hydrologic tools and team members, we could take land cover and elevation and um, precipitation, things that play a critical role in transport. And we could understand how those oasis move from the terrestrial environment into the ocean where sea otters are impacted. So I like to think of this as a time travel map. Again, as a veterinarian and epidemiologist, I had no idea what was going on here initially. And our hydrological team members helped us understand that we can find areas of greater risk for oasis flow to the ocean where they'll run off faster. And those are those bright orange areas along the landscape. And what this tells us now that we've, you know, taken the dive into domestic animal and wildlife and environmental health, it tells us that there are different areas of the landscape where oasis are gonna be loaded and make it to the ocean. So that tells us about the risk to people and sea otters downstream as well. So we actually could come up with estimates and models of loading that parallel where sea otters are infected. So from previous sea otter ecology and health studies, these dark blue areas are areas where sea otters had high levels of toxoplasma. And they parallel these areas through our modeling approaches where we think there's lots of oasis being loaded into and running off the landscape. And we can look at how this connects to domestic cats and wild felids. 
So with domestic cats, we see a really similar pattern. And these, these bright orange and red areas are actually really developed areas of the coast in many places. And when we look at mountain lions and bobcats, certainly they're contributing, but they're contributing in a really different way. And so by taking these together, it tells us that both wild felids, the wildlife around us and our domestic animals play a role in parasites and the risk of exposure to humans and animals sharing the landscape. But that role might change in different places. And we can use what we know from this One Health team to think about how we can, to think about how we can control the parasite in different areas. And so the idea that domestic cats play a role in toxoplasma is important in California, but we also play, see it in other systems as well. So New Zealand and Hawaii are two systems where there are only domestic cats and there are big conservation concerns there with toxoplasma in monk seals and Hector's dolphins and Maui dolphins where toxoplasma is impacting wildlife health from domestic cats. And so we can think about those modeling tools and our One Health knowledge and we can then ask, how does coastal development shape this? How does climate change shape this? We can look at cat management strategies and see how we could change OSIS runoff and the OSIS entering the marine system. And we can think about how would different building strategies, right? Different agricultural use or wetland restoration impact that flow. And so we can take all of that knowledge from the source to the sea. And that's where I'm gonna hand it off to Karen to dive into what's going on in the marine system. And it's a complex view into toxoplasma, but only through this One Health approach of bringing together diverse teams, have we been able to get to that handoff point. So I'll look forward to questions later, but I'll hand it off to Karen now. Thank you, Liz. Hi everyone, it's great to be here with you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'm gonna pick up exactly where uh, Liz left off. So you have a fantastic understanding now of toxoplasma biology and some of the complex ecological um, parameters that are at play with trans transmission on land. So um, when I started my research, I was a veterinarian in a small animal practice, and I decided to come back to graduate school specifically to study waterborne diseases. That was about 17 years ago. And I joined the team studying toxoplasma and sea otters to specifically focus on the, water the waterborne transmission and what is going on with oocysts, with this, these toxoplasma parasites once they hit the seawater. And the puzzle that we were facing when I started my research is that we knew that these parasites, these, these hardy oocysts, come from cats, but then that we had a really large proportion of sea otters, around 60% of sea otters in some locations are positive, are infected with this parasite. And if you think about the fact that this parasite only comes from cats, unlike some other parasites like Giardia that can come from cattle and humans and dogs, it was just odd. It was just strange that so many parasites could actually enter um, areas exactly where sea otters live and that so many sea otters are infected. It's a big ocean out there, so how come these oocysts are not just diluted and gone away with the currents? And that's when we partnered with oceanographers because at the veterinary school we just did not have the expertise to think about what is going on with particles in the ocean. And we learned about this really interesting phenomenon called marine snow. And this is a video taken from a kelp forest and you can see these white particles that are swooshing around. They're called marine snow. They're very important in the field of oceanography. They're basically clumps of organic and inorganic material. And the thing that's so significant about them is that they're packed with energy, with nutrients, and they sink. So this is the primary way, one of the primary ways by which energy and carbon and nitrogen move from the top layer where there's photosynthesis in the ocean down to the benthos. These particles also serve as food for invertebrates. So they provide a potential mechanism of entry into animals that either humans or sea otters can eat. But until about uh, just about 20 years ago, nobody really thought about the impact of these marine snow particles and pathogen transmission. So we really entered the field where when virtually nothing was known. And, and the reason why this is so important when thinking about toxoplasma 
is you can think about this owl oh, says this is what they look like when you shine UV light on them. They're, they're beautifully blue under uh, just using an autofluorescence property that they have. And so in seawater, they can either float. So here's a phytoplankton cell. This is just a phytoplankton that's um, uh, suspended next to an oocyst. Um, in an aggregate, they look like this. And the bottom line here is that an oocyst that is just swimming along as a single particle is a completely different beast in the ocean as compared with an oocyst that's entrained in an aggregate. So an oocyst that's just floating along is likely to be carried away. It will be getting more and more dilute as you get far away from the coast. And it's not likely to be consumed by anything such as a prey item because they don't recognize it as food. Whereas if oocysts, if toxoplasma gets stuck within these marine snow particles, they will sink. Therefore, if you have a lot of this aggregation and marine snow formation, you will start getting zones of a hotspot for transmission because you can actually get concentration of oocysts of toxoplasma where this marine snow formation occurs. On top of that, a, an invertebrate like a mussel or a snail, if it encounters uh, an aggregate like this, it's just packed of food. We call them snicker bars for invertebrates. It is much more likely to be able to access and ingest a parasite. So we wanted to really dive in deeper and think about when and where these marine snow particles um, form. And we learned again from our oceanographers that marine snow formation is complex. It has to do with salinity and currents, but a really uh, specific and important particle is TEP. TEP stands for transparent exopolymer particles, and it basically provides the glue for binding particles together once they collide into each other. So now we need to find out about TEP. And we found out again from our oceanographers that TEP is produced by phytoplankton, cyanobacteria, and kelp, which is of course critically important for the life of, um, of sea otters, for their ecology. And so we hypothesize that the association of toxoplasmosis with marine snow will increase as a function of TEP. So I'm gonna take you through a series of experiments to show you how we unraveled what happens with toxoplasma in, in specifically um, marine habitats where sea otters live. So through this first experiment, we tested for the association of oocysts with marine snow and seawater that we added TEP to. So we spiked in a compound that's called alginic acid, which is one specific type of TEP. If any of you have been at the beach and saw some pieces of kelp, you know that they're super slimy. So this picture here shows you this ooze, this, this slime that basically oozes off a cut surface of kelp because they're so slimy. So you can actually, well, we didn't do this, but companies actually harvest this material, this TEP, alginic acid, and sell it. And so you can access that for experiments. It's used in toothpaste and cosmetics. It's a very useful um, compound in the industry. And what we found is that the more TEP we added to the seawater, the more toxoplasma oocysts were ingrained inside these aggregates. In fact, in waters that contain as much TEP as uh, typically found in kelp forests, 80% of all the toxoplasma oocysts were bound inside these aggregates. We're also able to do some microscopy and we discovered some really neat uh, things that we just had no idea before. So remember I showed you how these oocysts look blue under UV. And so during these experiments, we can count them by, by filtering water and, and um, filters and then looking in a microscope, turning on the UV light and counting these blue oocyst-like structures. And this would be a typical picture right here. So I, I can see an oocyst, I can kind of see some debris around it and all of these little points here, th these red flecks are chlorophyll, they shine red under UV. So I know that those are phytoplankton, but I can't see too much. But when we did these experiments, we also added a specific dye called Alcyon Blue that stains TEP blue. And then if you turn on the light and you have the same filter stained, you start appreciating that this entire aggregate is embedded in TEP and not only that, all of these particles that look like distinct particles on my filter that do not look connected are now connected by filaments of TEP. 
So we had no idea before doing these experiments that there's all these interconnections of particles in our little mesocosms that are really bound together through these invisible webs of glue that now we're starting to appreciate. So that was a really exciting finding for us, but we knew that the story of how Toxo gets to sea otters could not end there. And the reason for that is that sea otters eat many different types of prey. Most of these prey items, so invertebrates, eat marine snow, but not all sea otters are infected equally. And in fact, epidemiologists that did this research uh, just before Liz and I joined the team found out that sea otters who specialize in marine snails are 12 times more likely to be infected with toxoplasma. Snails were the only dietary source that had this high risk for exposure. And what sets turban snails apart is that they graze on kelp. So they actually use a radula to scrape kelp from the surface of these fronds here on the right side. So the second set of experiments we did is testing whether toxoplasma can directly adhere or bind to the surface of kelp. And we did this experiment with surrogates. Um, and this is because we had oceanographers help us with these experiments in facilities where they had huge tank where they could keep kelp that actually moved back and forth with a current. And they weren't allowed to use something like an oocyst because of the biohazard danger. And so we actually developed and validated these tiny microspheres that have the same surface properties as toxoplasma oocysts. So that is what is shown here on the left. It's just a setup where you have your kelp and these uh, microspheres, which are the green balls. And then this is the paddle that keeps the water moving and squishing back and forth. And the bottom line is that we found that 30% of all these surrogates, so about one third, if you put them in a fairly big tank, you could recover them directly from the surface of the kelp. And because we used different um, combinations of real kelp and fake kelp from plastic and real seawater and, and fake seawater, we're able to directly attribute the binding of these surrogates to the tep that oozes from kelp. So here again, you see these flume of tap that is oozing from this kelp because we cut it and it's injured. So now it's releasing all this tap out into the seawater. And we can visualize these surrogates embedded on the tap that coats the kelp surfaces. So we're nearly there, right? We feel like we're putting all of these puzzle pieces together, but there's one thing that's missing and that's this dietary link in, in the snail specifically. So we did another set of experiments to test whether marine snails can serve as mechanical hosts for toxoplasma. This is important because they're not true intermediate hosts. The parasite toxoplasma cannot invade and replicate in uh, tissues from cold blooded animals, but some animals we already knew can concentrate them acting like a mechanical host. But we didn't know anything about the ability of snails to do this at the time that we did the studies. So basically the way this worked, is that we brought snails in from a kelp forest from the same area where I showed you that video of, of marine snow in a kelp forest. We put them in a tub with kelp um, and seawater and, and aeration. And we added both toxoplasma in these, these uh, microspheres to the water. We let that in, uh, sit for 24 hours. And then after the exposure period, we transferred the snail to these containers that we called snail condos. So each one of these condos contained one snail and a piece of kelp and seawater. And we changed the seawater every day so that we can follow them in time. Excuse me for a second. And if we follow those snails over two weeks, what we found is that the snails were still retaining toxoplasma oocysts for 11 days after we removed them from the contaminated water. So we knew that they're hanging on to these oocysts over time. And we also found that they're concentrating both the oocysts and the surrogates by two to three orders of magnitude in their tissues. And we kept seeing these structures here. And these were not the actual fecal pellets from the, from the snails. These were microscopic particles. And at the time, we didn't quite understand what these were. But again, luckily, because we're working with oceanographers and we thought about our system, they thought they knew what they were. And this is what we figured out. And so here on this video, you see one of the snails in our experiment. 
And you see how they came to our lab with a complete ecosystem on their backs. They're not some kind of like a rodent model from a lab. This is the real deal from a kelp forest. And they have all these barnacles on their backs. And hopefully you can see their feeding apparatus goes in and out and they're filtering water. And so what we think happened is that they're concentrating the toxoplasma, they're pooping those out. So that particle that I showed up here, this is barnacle poop, a microfecal pellet. And so they're pooping that out and then that gets contaminated all over the surface of, of our little snail condo, as well as the kelp. And you can see all this munched up kelp in the background, that's what the snails are eating. So the snails are probably picking up these super concentrated fecal pellets with toxoplasma, concentrating it in their bodies and then pooping those out in their own stool. So super fascinating and complicated beyond what we even thought when we set up this experiment. So the bottom line, the conclusion from these sets of data is that snails are actually very efficient mechanical hosts for toxoplasma. They can both prolong the exposure period. So thinking about a storm that's bringing in contaminated uh, water with fecal material from cats, the storm, the fresh water is long gone. Within hours, you can't find a trace of, of fresh water in after a typical storm in California. But the contaminants, the toxoplasma can stick right at the border of, of the marine transition from land to sea because these animals can concentrate it in their tissues for up to 11 days after the storm has passed. And they're also really efficient bioconcentrators by concentrating these oocysts two to three orders of magnitude as compared to what was present in the seawater. And so basically through these series of experiments, we think that we have unraveled this mystery of how can a land parasite infect so many otters? So what we found is that toxoplasma can concentrate in the coastal ecosystem through two mechanisms, two distinct but not mutually exclusive mechanisms, right? Because you can have this enrichment in marine snow and you can have this association with kelp. So the more of this adhesion with marine snow that you have, which again is super prevalent in places where sea otters live with kelp forests, the more of the settling you're gonna have, the more concentration in one place they can settle and aggregate and form a layer on kelp forests. The more of these healthy kelp fronds that you see, the more tep, the more tep, the more marine snow. So you have this kind of positive reinforcing loop cycle here that helps concentrate in a train the toxoplasmaosis exactly, exactly where sea otters live. And once the oocysts, the toxoplasma is present in the kelp, you can see the snails um, now are very efficient vectors and they can transmit the parasite to any suspecting sea otter that eats them. Um, so these mechanisms were, were very specific for California, right? But uh, Liz mentioned other systems that we're really interested in working in where, where other marine mammals are highly impacted. So this is a Hector dolphin from New Zealand. Liz and I just participated in a workshop a couple of months ago because this is such a big threat to the conservation of this species. And so we don't know exactly what the pathways are there in terms of how these, these dolphins are getting exposed, but I would suspect that similar parallel systems are important to New Zealand. And now let's not, let's not forget public health, right? So many of us could be exposed through similar pathways. I recognize that the pathway on the, on the bottom might be um, less probable for many of us. This is an actual swim, swim team in California where they, they're called the kelp crawlers and they like to recreate in practice their swimming in kelp forests near Monterey Bay. Many of us like seafood, right? I, I love bivalve shellfish. I, I, I do eat fewer of them now, given the type of research I do, but I enjoy fresh uncooked oysters. And this could be a, a real pathway for infection for people and something that we're doing a lot of research on. Um, I specifically put a picture of mussels in New Zealand because we know that there is an issue in, um, in New Zealand with toxoplasma and hector dolphins. And we also involved with research there showing a fairly high uh, proportion of these green-lipped mussels from supermarkets that were contaminated with toxoplasma DNA. 
So I know that we promised you perspectives from, uh, from California, but I am going to, to take this a little bit more broadly now into a couple of other global locations where we work just to spend the last five to 10 minutes uh, today talk, showing you some other examples. Specifically, um, as you heard from Luciana, I spent some time in uh, Canada and I just got back about a year ago. I spent about five years at the University of Guelph. And when I was there, I was able to collaborate with several faculty to look at a project in Iqaluit, Nunavut, specifically looking at clams as a source of protozoan pathogens in these communities. So a little bit of background. Um, Iqaluit is uh, located right here. It's the capital of Nunavut, which is one of the territories just north of Canada. Toxoplasma exposure in indigenous communities is very high in this territory, 40 to 60%. It might sound not so high compared to some communities, locations like Brazil, right? So we know in Brazil, toxoplasma is a very serious public health uh, risk, but compared to other areas in North California, especially the US, it's much, much higher. And there is a, a true concern, especially among pregnant women about it being exposed during pregnancy. So just to review the life cycle, this is actually a bit different from what Liz showed because the life cycle that we developed for our work is very much focused on coastal California. Whereas when we're thinking about the system in a One Health context in the North, especially in the Arctic, you have to think about the different specific hosts and pathways that could be important for exposing people. So for example, the only felids there would be cats in Canada lynx even though Canada lynx don't even reach as far north as Iqaluit. They do reach some of the other um, Arctic locations that are near, nearby. You have to think about the specific types of intermediate hosts that are important for the life cycle. And then you specifically, in our case, here we're focused on human public health, need to think about the different pathways of infection to people. So we have a lot of uh, hunting of gay meat, we can also have oocyst transmission, especially through shellfish, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you also have to think about marine mammal infections, not just for the well being of the marine mammal populations, but because these species are hunted and consumed by the people as a source of food. And of course, don't forget the, the, the importance of congenital transmission when women are infected and can transmit this to their babies. And so we're particularly interested in clams, and that is because that is what the communities asked us to study. So this was a community-based investigation. The clams are critical uh, components of the diet in these communities for two reasons, for cultural continuity. This, this region is very rich in its history, some of which is quite, um, negative and unpleasant when Westerners, white people came in and basically barred communities, native communities from eating what they have been uh, taught in uh, past in generations as the best foods for them. So the fact that they're now in the, in the several past decades allowed to restart their culture has really tremendous importance in terms of um, native community well-being and, and sustainability. And also because they're a healthy food source, right? So the same problems that occur in other native communities in terms of diabetes, at least here in North America, are true in native communities in Canada. And so these provide an alternative to packaged, you know, high calorie, low nutrient foods that they can buy in supermarkets. So the question that they posed to us is, are clams a potential source of toxoplasma in indigenous communities near Iqaluit? So again, I mentioned this was community-based approach. Um, our graduate student, Anna Manor, did an incredible job with engaging with community members. So what she did is she held town hall meetings to engage them and she disseminated information and posters. These posters were uh, uh, placed all over town as well as brochures that they could pick up. And they're both uh, presented in English with a very catchy title, Clamoring for Clams but also in their own native dialect and in, and in Tuktitut. And she engaged them by waiting at the harbor. Here, the picture on, on the bottom left, these are all clam harvesters coming back at sunset after they harvested clams. So she would wait right there where the boats came and they're allowed to exchange up to 10 clams in exchange for a small gift. 
So for our results, um, this map basically shows you the sampling points. So there are a total of 390 clams. Um, this inset here is just a blown up view of the sampling points near Iqaluit, which were the predominant points. We also had three sampling points a little bit farther away from town. And Rebecca Fung was the master's student that actually did the toxoplasma uh, PCR work at the University of Guelph. And she was able to detect toxoplasma DNA in 10 clams from sites three and one here that are somewhat close to Ecaloate. And so this might not sound like a high number, but in comparison, this is high, a higher prevalence of contamination in a shellfish animal compared to what we found in California. So even though this doesn't sound like very much, this was highly significant. It's also the very first time that protozoan pathogens and specifically toxoplasma were found in the Arctic in shellfish. So, okay, so we detected toxoplasma, but one of the mysteries that we're still trying to unravel is where are the oocysts coming from to the ocean? You'd think about domestic cats, right? But there's very few domestic cats in Iqaluit. We think that there's a handful and they don't roam outside because they would die. All right, so what about native cats? So the Canada lynx does exist in some areas of the Arctic, but not in Iqaluit. So here's Iqaluit here in this red diamond in this green shaded areas is the range for the Canada lynx. So the closest area here in Quebec is still a couple of thousands kilometers to the south. I don't have an answer to this. I'm happy to, to come back and, and discuss this in the question and answer um, time if, if people are interested. Another aspect that is super important in terms of a One Health consideration is how do we message these results? How do we share these and what do we tell community members? So automatically me, as somebody who has not worked with native communities before, you wanna say, cook the clams, right? Because cooking temperature, high temperature is one of the only ways to really reliably inactivate oocysts, to kill the oocysts. But telling a native community how to cook their food is absolutely frowned upon. So we cannot come into a community where they've already been overrun and treated terribly by white Westerners and tell them how to cook food that they were taught by their ancestors to prepare in very specific ways. So this is where we really had to work with the public health agencies in Iqaluit and in Nunavut to together form brochures and come up with respectful um, ways to disseminate our information without actually telling them what they can or cannot do. Okay, the last couple of minutes, I'm actually gonna talk about toxoplasmosis in Brazil. So I hope that this is gonna be of particular interest to, to those of you who are joining us from Brazil. Um, so this is a research project that Liz and I became involved with just about a year ago. And the background behind um, this One Health problem is the importance of congenital toxoplasmosis in Brazil. So congenital toxoplasmosis, again, this occurs when a woman transmits the infection to her fetus during pregnancy. The rate, the incidence of congenital toxoplasmosis is the highest in Brazil as compared to other locations. The, the, um, one of the preceding uh, notions about toxoplasma transmission in South America more generally beyond Brazil is that there's a lot of virulent strains present. And there's a lot of reasons for this and I'm happy to spend some time thinking about this and, and speaking with you during the questions and answers session. Because there's more virulent strains, there's also more virulent outcome. Sometimes when a woman gets infected during pregnancy, the, the baby's born at least appearing completely normal. But adverse effects like pretty severe birth defects or even death of the fetus that would manifest as abortion or stillbirth is more likely to occur in Brazil. And we think that that has to do because among other reasons, because of these more virulent strains of the parasites. We also think that there's higher frequency of exposure in South America. And again, this has to do with water. So exactly what Liz was introducing at the beginning of the seminar, seminar is critically important in these locations where you have high poverty surrounded with, with forested areas, a lot of biodiversity, different types of cats. So you can think about all the interactions between domestic cats and all of these different types of wild cats and the fact that you have super dense urban environments with people that just don't have the access 
and the economical means to obtain clean water. So um, this is again a pretty new project. I don't have any results to share. We are, we're partnering with uh, two key collaborators in Brazil, uh, Dr. Lilian Bahia Oliveira, Oliveira from Macaé and Dr. Renato Damata from Campos. And so the study region right now that is included is, uh, are these two municipalities in the state of Rio. And there's several interlinked aims, but the overarching objective is to investigate the role of precipitation patterns, habitat type, and socioeconomic status on toxoplasma exposure during pregnancy in Rio, Brazil. And I would be more than happy to come back in a year or two and, and share our results, but we just started, um, so we don't have much to share yet. And um, check the time. I'm hoping that we're, we're still okay. This concludes our talk. So I'll go ahead and stop uh, sharing my screen. And I think we can start the Q&A unless there's anything else from our moderators. Yeah, thank you very much, you, Carrie and Liz. Yeah, I, I know you have a lot of information. It was amazed to, for me, it was amazed to, to learn a little bit, especially about the clams. <laughs> And in Canada, and uh, I was worried about this and happening probably in different parts of the world. And as you mentioned, I know that you have this this project with Brazil. So uh, I don't know if it's, it's the same kind of project, but if you if you can just talk a little bit, I know that Dr. Lilian is not here, unfortunately, today, but. If you can just tell uh, if the research in the same way, looking for uh, food and in which state are you located here in Brazil to investigate this? Yeah, so, um, so right now we're just working at the two municipalities in Rio state. Okay. So Macaé and Campos. Campos. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and, and the study is a bit different. So this is, um, there's several layers to the study and we have some funding pending. What oh. we already have been funded to start through a seed grant from UC Davis is a seroprevalence study. Um, so um, we have access through Lillian's hard work actually. So Lillian has been a really key uh, person in Brazil to start a national surveillance program for tracking uh, exposure to toxoplasma in pregnant women. So my understanding is that it has not been required until quite recently, and now it's a nationally implemented new uh, surveillance program. And so we will have access, um, we're still waiting for all the ethical um, permitting to occur, to a data set of women who have been exposed for the first time to toxoplasma during pregnancy. So it's quite different in that it, it's looking at presence of antibodies in women. It's not really tracking and tracing the source of the parasite through these, these location. But I know that Liz and I have, I have, um, have had lots of conversations and ideas on doing more in terms of looking at domestic cats and looking at wild felids and really trying to find the, the primary routes by which women are infected so that we can actually implement some mitigation. Yeah, yeah. and unfortunately, I know that we will find a lot of things here because we have a huge coast and a lot of animals. And so unfortunately, we will probably find things here. Uh, we have a question uh, from our chat. Um, from Tiki Sebastian, um, he's asking uh, about how long can a, a toxoplasma survive in the ocean? In yeah. Great question. Yes, um, <clears throat> the short answer is that it's up to two years from, from the one study that actually did this for a period of time. So if the water is kept cold, then the osis can survive for up to two years. Now, we don't know that they die at two years. That's just when the study ended. So we would say probably at least two years in seawater. In freshwater, the longest that I've seen is four and a half years in cold seawater. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we have a question from Beatriz. Uh, 
Silvestre. Uh, she's asking, uh, which hydrology programs do you use? I think at least talk about the hydrology program, right? Sure, uh, that's another great question. So um, what I would say is that with no formal training as a hydrologist, it was a really exciting experience for me to get to work with people who have so much understanding of different models and different systems. And we got to talk about how do you even link parasites to freshwater flow? That was a really big question. And there are some models that exist as like package systems, like the SWAP model. We actually wound up using a model, a model that we programmed based on really simple rainfall runoff models that take precipitation and help translate that into runoff based on um, factors like the elevation in the area, the land cover type. But there are lots of ways you could approach this. There are people working on this in Hawaii who are using a different modeling system. I think the power is in just really bringing those um, skills and disciplines together to think about how do you transport pathogens? How do you understand how they move in a landscape where they're basically invisible? We can't always see them, right? And so, um, so there's not necessarily one program and I think it's probably suited to the different areas. Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, I was curious about where those oases from Canada, probably they, where they come from, where, that is the hypothesis. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, so, so there's a couple of things that we are considering. So one is looking at the community of cats that is there, right? So it seems highly unlikely, but no one has tested the cats. No one has really had access to, to feces. Um, it, hap it just so happened that the wastewater treatment plant was not even functional at the time when we did the work. So any, and, and, the tra and apparently also the trash where the landfill is, it's right there on the coast as well. So any kind of fecal material, whether it was flushed in the toilet or put in the landfill, everything is right there on the coast and you have precipitation and you have runoff. I don't know that I can conceive of a way that such a small number of cats can cause contamination to the degree that we can pick up in clams, but that is a, a possibility. Um, another option that we're looking at is OSIS movement through, um, OS, through locations in the south. So Quebec to the south has um, a lot of domestic cats. It has Canada lynx. And we're looking at specific pathways to see if just the movement of water currents um, could be sufficient to drive some oocyst moving northwards. Um, there's also possibilities of peritonic hosts like mechanical hosts, so fish, for example, things that like snails may be able to concentrate the parasite but actually move. We know that oocysts can survive in the GI tract of fish. So animals can move oasis from, di from different locations if you have populations that are migrating from south to north. Um, there's, there's a couple of other ones that, that are a little bit unlikely. So I think I'll pause there and see if there's other questions unless, you, unless there aren't any more and then I can blabber on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I need to say congrats for both of you. I was impressed. How can you work together so well? Seems like one. <laughs> so good. We like each other a lot. <laughs> okay, this is awesome. And but I have one question is, and we are from Brazil, and we have a lot of problem for sure with toxoplasmosis in Brazil. But in general, we make a correlation between toxoplasmosis and floods in Brazil and cats and this kind of thing. And my idea in the beginning as a person that is working with environment is that toxoplasmosis in Brazil is correlated with warmer places. We have this idea that in Brazil we have more toxoplasmosis in places like Rio de Janeiro and in places like this. Do you know if there are any work about the correlation between toxoplasmosis infestation and temperature, because you had you, you developed this this research in Canada, uh, uh, Karen, and so it's uh, 
serve really cold places. And I know that Liz is working now for a long time with places with flood in Nebraska and things like that. And so my question is, are there any work or any research about temperature? Because I know about precipitation, but temperature and toxoplasmosis infestation? I can start a little bit and then maybe hand it over to, to Liz. So what you describe about looking at the relationship between temperature and prevalence of toxoplasma in Brazil based on temperature is actually one of the questions that our graduate student who, who uh, Liz and I co-mentor, that is something she wanted to do and we're hoping to do, but we're challenged by the fact that it's so difficult to get data nationally for Brazil right now. So right now we're just hoping to look at two municipalities in one state. So expanding that to an entire country as big as Brazil and, and getting sufficient data, I think will be a challenge, but one that Liz and I would happily embrace because I think it's a really important topic. Um, we do know that toxoplasma prefers colder temperatures in general. The warmer the temperature, the, the faster they, they do die. So even though they're very robust, temperature is just about the only thing that can reliably kill them. So, so I guess one of the automatic things that I'm thinking about is whether the warmer places in Brazil are also wetter because osis also really like humidity. So, so dry heat will kill them, but humid, mild heat probably won't kill them as fast. And, and dr again, dry will kill them faster than humid. So if these areas are also wetter, then I would definitely think that that would be a factor that we would need to look at as well. So that's from the osis biology perspective. Liz, I don't know if you have anything, like think about cats in, in warmer areas and. Yeah, so I, I think like Karen's saying there, I think there are a lot of factors interacting. So the temperature, the humidity, even the microclimate. So like the type of vegetation that is there, for example. So, um, you know, I'm still learning about the geography and ecosystems of Brazil, but it makes me wonder about the distribution of forest systems and, you know, what kind of wild field hosts and domestic cats might live there and might be interacting. Um, if you have a lot more of the source of the felids in a certain area, it could contribute to more oasis loading and that could, you know, relate to oasis survival too. Those always, you kind of always have to balance those, how much is going into the ecosystem and how much is surviving and can be transported or contacted by a host and cause infection. Um, so I think it's a really complex question. It would be fascinating to know how those environmental characteristics, if we just think about parameters like temperature and precipitation or humidity, how those relate to the distribution of habitats and cats and cities and things like that. I think that intermix is really kind of that one health interface, right? Of like, how, how is the landscape shaping all of all of these transmission questions. So, so I don't have a great answer, but I think it's a fascinating question for, for exploring. And I have just one more very yeah. short question. Yeah. Is Karen, wh what is the main uh, economic activity in this place in Canada? There really isn't much. It's it's mostly native. Um, native people. So it's it's a community that you know has been there for I don't even know centuries, right? But there isn't anything that they export or produce there. So um, they are looking at establishing a shellfish um, industry, which is part of the reasons that they invited us to come up and start looking at the health and, and the, the safety and health of consuming shellfish and exporting it. So there's nothing that is produced there economically. It's just a fairly small community, even though it's the biggest community in Nunavut, it's still fairly small, just a few thousand people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al. We have more questions. I have one question here. Um, if, can it be spread by sheep ballast water? Oh, that's an interesting one. I think I have heard that one before. I wonder if there's even a study out there that tested this. I mean, theoretically, yes. I, I don't see a reason why, why not. So in terms of a ship dumping water in a Iqaluit and, and dumping it there. Thank you. I think that's an excellent idea. We have not thought about that one before. See the benefits of presenting to an intelligent One Health audience. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't see why not. I don't know what type of boat traffic, um, but you know, a lot of the food, you know, most of the food is actually flown in. You can only access the harbor during some times of the year, but you know, summer would be the time that it's there's there's not ice. So you can't get in by by sea most of the year. But there's two or three months when when the ice recedes, melts, and then you can access that area. So I don't know if that if that was why they brought it up, but I I love the idea. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, I know that Sebastian had another question here. Uh, so do you know if there are studies in the southern hemisphere or of what toxoplasma produce and its repercussions on people, especially in Chile, where there are bivalve crops near large cities? Because here he is in Chile. There, there are salmon and mussel crops. So what would be the risk for human consumption? I don't recall seeing publications from Chile on toxoplasma in seafood. There, are, there is one or two from Brazil, um, but I don't recall seeing one from more Southern locations in South America. So I don't know. Um, yeah, with fish, we don't really think about it as much as a danger because we don't eat the digestive systems of fish, right? So you eat the, the flesh, the meat, and the parasite doesn't invade the meat like it does for a true intermediate host, like a sheep or human. Um, but with bivalves like mussels, yes, because we eat the entire animal, including the GI tract where the oocysts concentrate. Okay, thank you. I, and, okay. I, and I was thinking that as we are living today uh, with the pandemic, and we discussed this a lot with Lise and the, the Nebraska One Health Group about the bats, because bats now are seen as the villains and they are, they are banned because we have COVID. And now we know listening about this, of course, we cannot call the, the snails and the wild cats and the cats as our villains for the disease. So uh, the challenge is to work with education, right? To, to try to educate people about this because we have to, to work with the prevention. So what is the most challenge now you think about this in the educate now? Liz, do you want to take that one? If there's a question, I if can there's start. an answer. <laughs> I can start. And so I think some of it is understanding the system. So, you know, like you're saying, toxoplasma occurs naturally in wild systems, right? Wild felids all over the world shed toxoplasma. We know that there are these marine cycles where it can become incorporated. And, you know, I think certainly like when we think about wildlife connections with disease, the answer I think is not necessarily like, how do we eliminate it, right? It's how do we live together and how do we protect the health and conserve wildlife at the same time? And so, when we think about toxoplasma, there's a lot that goes into how it gets to its next host, right? Well, how the oasis gets to somebody else. And sometimes that's linked to the animals that are there, but sometimes it's linked to the way that we're using the environment, right? And so if we are building lots of concrete areas and putting in huge cities and changing wildlife distributions and converting agriculture rapidly, that can all impact the amount of toxoplasma as well as how it runs off into water if we're thinking about waterborne transmission. And so I think we have to think creatively, not only about how we take care of our domestic pets and you know what they're putting into the outside world, if it's the case of shedding toxoplasma, but how could we come up with creative building solutions that minimize our impact? You know, so thinking about the role of wetlands and filtering pathogens, thinking about you know, how we can have agriculture interacting or bordering natural systems or more undeveloped areas. I think there's a lot to explore with creative solutions. And I think that's where One Health really brings together so many different perspectives to think about not only what's going on with transmission, but how you can manage disease in different populations. But it's a complex question. I always lean toward community engagement and art and science outreach, um, but I think it's, you know, it draws upon everything we learned from the research too. Karen, do you wanna take it from there? I think you covered it. I mean, I think it, yeah. I mean, I can just echo a few words what um, Liz was saying, just thinking about the entire pathway of source to sea 
and where can we minimize risk? And so you can think about cat management practices, but then also the transport route. So how do we build communities to minimize freshwater runoff and contaminated runoff per se? So we like to really look at toxoplasma as a surrogate for so many other contaminants. So if, if we look at ways of retaining waste before it gets to the sea, thinking about wetlands and, and different types of filtration mechanisms to clean water before it, it gets dumped into the ocean. We're not gonna just be helping with toxo, we're gonna be helping to reduce contamination with a lot of other pathogens and pesticides and, and chemicals. So toxoplasma is just one really clear example to think about the issue of water contamination you know, uh, holistically. Okay, thank you, yeah. So uh, I see that we, we have all the questions. Oh, I have we, the last question is um, which other disease that we can see spreaded in the water like toxoplasma? We know that we have a lot, but I, maybe we, we, if you could give some examples of zoonosis maybe. Yeah, there's, oh, there's so many. I mean, so thinking about other protozoan parasites, Cryptosporidium and Giardia, we actually looked at both of those uh, with the clams, same, same route, so waterborne transmission contaminating the clams. We did find uh, Giardia, uh, zoonotic assemblage B, Giardia enterica in the clams, and we were able to link that to Giardia in the sled dogs. So that was another really neat kind of One Health story. Um, cryptosporidiosis caused the biggest waterborne outbreak documented to date that I know of. So about half a million people got infected in Milwaukee in the 1990s. Um, norovirus is, is a really infective virus. Um, what are we missing? A bacteria. Um, you know, leptospirosis is a really good example for what happens after flooding. I was thinking about that when, when Liz was talking about too much water is also not good. And after hurricanes, um, for example, in Puerto Rico, there was a big leptospirosis outbreak uh, because all the streets were flooded. And, and this one comes from urine of rodents. So all this urine, rodent urine that accumulates when it's dry gets washed into the streets and people have to like walk through the flooded water just to get places. And, and you can get infected that way. I, think I wanted to add to that comment if it's okay. Yeah. My brother lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he got leptospirosis from contaminated floodwaters when uh, the Tietê River flooded in one of those big intense uh, uh, um, floods, uh, rainfalls, and he almost died of it, but he recovered, thank God. But it was, it, it's, re it's true, it's a reality. Yeah, I, I think a lot of these pathogens can be very serious. And, you know, I think we're still learning about all of the ones that do flow off the system. There's in, you know, Nebraska is a very heavy agricultural state and in livestock production systems, people are, you know, concerned about connections between manure or lagoons and runoff of pathogens from livestock or runoff of, um, organisms that have antimicrobial resistance genes that could impact um, exposure downstream. And so it's really diverse, but we think Toxo is a good model for how you can understand those linkages and then kind of apply it to other pathogens. I hope, I hope uh, the flooding that people, you know, it's, it's a scary impact on public health. So I hope that your family members and others are, are doing well. Well, yeah, I think we will, we will finish with this question of Ben. And do you think the current pandemic has any influence on toxoplasma spread or reduction? And what impacts, impact does this pandemic has on waterborne disease? That's a good question. I have to say, I have not thought about this one. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Liz, do you have any clever answers? Uh, I don't know that I have a clever answer. I think that, um, what strikes me when I hear that is, wow, that's a complex question, right? Because the pandemic has reshaped life as we know it. Our behavior patterns are different. The way we go to the grocery store is different. The way we go to school is different. Um, you know, I think there could be maybe long-term changes in how we think about transportation and cities and agriculture. And so I, I would say that is a fantastic One Health question that could use some investigation in the coming years to really understand. I think it's, I think it's going to be a really complex answer. Yeah, unfortunately in Brazil we have, we have had now problems with 
uh, animals in the street, especially after we started the pandemic and the numbers are higher now. So maybe we can, we can see problems related to the pandemic because we have more animals in the streets here. Yeah, that's, that's a really excellent point, Luciana. So I think that there is really strong evidence already that you know, wildlife movement patterns and um, willingness to use cities, for example, the patterns are changing. And so when you think about toxoplasma and wildlife and domestic host interaction, it raises some really good questions. I just want to say thank you for both of you. It was an amazing, as Professor Paulo said, it was really nice to see you handling this together. It was great. <laughs> And it congrats for your work and for your research. And especially to say that, that for your outreach program that I know that it's amazing doing what you do and trying to, to put this in the mind that it's so important, the, the One Health and to take care of what we are living before. So Professor Paulo, you have the word. I need to say thank you, Dr. Karen, thank you, Dr. Liz, and thank you, Luciana, for your amazing work today. Thank you, folks. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you very much.